Hello, my name is Luke Jones and welcome to my second webcast tutorial. Um, today I want to talk about the scalar property of timing and in particular the idea of the property of superimposition. Superimposition is a test we use to check whether our data conforms to scalar timing. OK, let's, let's start at the beginning then. Scalar timing. Scalar timing makes two main predictions or main descriptions of what timing data should look like. Okay? The first of these is mean accuracy. All this means is that on average people's perception of durations should be accurate. Okay? So an example of this is from Weir and McShane, uh, 1988 I think, um, and what they did, they used interval production. Okay, and in interval production, all that happens is that you ask people to um, hold down a button for a certain duration. Okay, and you do a whole series of them. So please hold down this button for one second. Please hold down this button for half a second. Please hold this button down for two seconds. You get the idea. Um, and when you pl plot the data on the graph, so here is what they were asked to produce. So um, their target time. And on the y-axis you plot what they actually produced, so their actual production. Okay, so maybe we have half a second, one second, two seconds, etc., four seconds, whatever. Um, what you get is something like this. Okay, so the, the longer the, the amount of time you're asking to produce, the, the longer the actual time they do produce. Okay, so on average they're, they're accurate, and they have a kind of linear relationship between the two. Okay, so that's, that's mean accuracy, that's quite simple to um, grasp, quite simple to understand. Okay, the second prediction or description of timing data is that the timing data should exhibit the scalar property. Okay, so the scalar property. In a nutshell, all this really means is that as we increase the magnitude of the duration, as the duration gets longer, we get steadily worse and worse at timing it. We get more variable in our timing. Okay? Um, but it's, it's, it's saying something a bit more stricter than that. It's basically saying that the amount of variability, our sensitivity to duration, scales up with how long that duration is. Okay? So if I double the duration, you should be twice as bad at timing it, or twice as variable at timing it. Okay? And again, in, in the Weird McShane, with, with the production data I've just shown you, um, if you look at the paper, they present the data in, in, in a couple of other different ways which um, show this scale of property. Okay? So this time, instead of plotting um, the mean time produced against the mean target time, this time we plot the standard deviation against the target time. Okay, so how variable each of their productions was. Okay, and you get exactly the same thing. You, you get a, 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 a linear relationship. Okay, so basically, as the target time increases, so the standard deviation increases. As the target time increases, their variability increases. They get worse at timing the longer the duration is. But the scalar property is something more, more stronger than that. It's saying that if I double the target time, I should double the amount of variability. Okay, so how, how do we test this? Well, what we need to do is to divide the standard deviation by the target time. Okay? If the standard deviation is always a constant fraction of the mean, then that should, number should always be equal, um, should, should always give the same result. Okay? So this is called the coefficient of variation. It's our test of the scalar property. Okay? So, the graph I showed you before was their um, production versus target time. Okay, so as the target time increased, their production increased. Then here we have their target time plus to get how variable their, their productions were. And now I want to see whether this increase is proportional to this increase. If I double the target time, do I double the standard deviation? So what I'm going to do is simply divide this by this, okay, so it should give me a, a, a constant number. And we call this the coefficient of variation. Okay, so coefficient of variation is equal to the standard deviation 
divided by the mean time, or the target time in this case. Okay, so if you, if you imagine, if, I, if, I, if this is true, if it's true that um, our variability is a constant fraction of the mean, okay, so if I, if I double the duration, I double the standard deviation, then this should be a constant, always going to be a constant number here, okay? So if I double the target time, okay, so that if I go from asking them to produce one second to asking them to produce two seconds, this will double, but this standard deviation should also double. So you'll always get a constant number, a constant coefficient of variation. Okay? And again, if you go back and look at the McShane, weird McShane paper, if we plot co um, coefficient of variation against target time, then what you end up with is, is, is more or less like a straight line, a flat line. So this proves our scalar property. Okay? So the scalar property is just saying that our variability or sensitivity scales up. If I double the duration that you, you, I'm asking you to time, I'll double how variable you are at timing it. That's all scalar property is. Okay, so that, that's one way we can prove that we have um, this scalar property. Um, there, are, there are other ways of proving it, depending on what the timing task is that we've used. Okay, so if you go back to our old friend, um, temporal generalization, okay? Um, again, I'm not going to go through the whole technique of temporal generalization. You should, you should be familiar with it now. Um, if you remember, the data from um, temporal generalization generally looks something like this. So we have how often they say yes. Uh, here we have the standard duration. Here we have ones that are shorter. Here we have ones that are longer. And you get something like this. Okay. Now, remember when I um, described this in the lectures, I told you to think about, when you're, when you're thinking about graphs of, of performance, um, a, a good way of getting a handle on it is to imagine what the graph would look like in two extreme situations. One extreme is if you did this experiment and the person was completely insensitive to time, they just resp responding randomly. If that, if that was the case, then they'd be equally likely to say yes regardless of how long the comparison duration was. Okay, so you basically get a flat line. Okay? If they were absolutely perfect at the task, okay, um, they would only ever say yes when you gave them the standard um, when you give them the standard duration as a comparison, and they'd say no all of the times. Okay? So you would get essentially this. Okay? So normal data looks something like this. So the steepness of this gradient the state, how steep this, this um, graph is gives you an indication of how good they are at the task or how sensitive they are at, at the timing or how variable their um, temporal representation is. Okay, so the, the wider this is, the more this resembles a, goes towards being a flat line, the more variable they are. The, the steeper it becomes, the more sensitive they are. Okay, so by looking at, looking at a temporal generalization graph, we can look at um, how variable people are. Okay, but in a temporal generalization task, we'd like to be able to test this um, scalar property. Okay, and in order to do that, we need to run the experiment twice with um, different durations of standards. Okay, so we're testing whether when we increase the duration to be timed, we increase how variable they are proportionally. Okay, so one way of doing this would be to run this experiment with a 400 millisecond standard and then run it again with an 800 millisecond standard. Okay? So I'm going to talk you through one example and then we'll see how we can use this test of superimposition. Okay.